My sermon passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 to 31, page 995. The Apostle Paul is writing. I mean, brethren, the appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. The form of this world is passing away, the Apostle Paul wrote about 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. Now we can add up the years, and we can say, as it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years as one day. And, thanks be to God, we can say, as it also says, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is forbearing towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And we still acknowledge that, as Second Peter continues, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. And we can hear Jesus himself say in Matthew 24, verse 36, but of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. We can hear all that and say all that and believe every bit of it, but the apparent fact remains that the Apostle Paul's expectation of Christ's return was not met in the way that Paul expected. That's putting it kindly. To put it bluntly, Paul was wrong. Now, saying that out loud would get me put in the hermeneutics hoosgau in most of the churches around here, hermeneutics being the study of interpretation of the Bible, and hoosgau being, well, hoosgau, jail. Paul was wrong? If Paul was wrong, then how can you believe anything else he wrote? Well, very carefully and prayerfully, but mainly carefully. Don't elevate the written words of Scripture to the level of the Holy Word, who is Christ, even if some of us do colloquially call the Bible the Word of God, because that's idolatry, which is a big no-no. No matter how inspired we believe the Bible is. And pay attention to what Paul says himself. Just above this passage in 1 Corinthians, talking about husbands and wives should get along, Paul wrote, during what he believed were the end times, he wrote, I say this by way of concession, not of command. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own special gift from God, one of one kind, and one of another. And a little bit later he says, to the married I give charge, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, let her remain single or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. And then he adds, to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. And then he says, Only let everyone lead the life which the Lord has assigned to him, and in, and in which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. And he goes on, Now concerning the unmarried, I have no command of the Lord, but I give my opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is well for a person to remain as he is. It's a little confusing. And then Paul says in today's passage, I mean, brethren, and I like that, 
I mean, in my own native vernacular, that's like, I tell you what. I tell you what, the appointed time has grown very short. For the form of this world is passing away. But then it didn't. The form of this world did not pass away. And so this passage, especially after 2,000 years, doesn't mean much to us today, does it? The form of this world did not pass away. Or did it? It did. Again and again, before Paul said it, as Paul believed it, and after Paul said it. But again, not in the way that Paul expected. I think that hope, eschatological expectation, quote, end times hope, I think it's wired into us all. Let me say, as Paul did, I say this by way of concession, not of command. I have no command of the Lord, but I give my opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy, I hope, is trustworthy. One, for the apostle Paul, the end was near. And close behind him, and way behind him, and the end was close ahead of him, and way ahead of him. Specifically, the destruction of the Jewish temple, right? By Rome in like 68 or 70. And two, for us the end is near. Close behind us, and way behind us, and the end is close ahead of us, and way ahead of us. Let me explain. Paul first. The Apostle Paul's entire religious history and ancient mythology was one end time followed by a new time, one after the other. And actually, as Christians, it's our religious history and foundational mythology, too. Adam and Eve had a good time, then an end time, and then a new time. The builders of the Tower of Babel had a good time building that monument to themselves. Then they had an end time, one of confusion, of minds and languages. Then came a new time. The whole world had a hell of a time until Noah's time. Then there was a soaking end time. And then for Noah and his family, there was a new time. Time after time in the Bible, there is a time, an end time, and a new time. I think it's part of just Christian DNA, if not all of humanity. Abram, minding his own business, having a time in Ur, in south, rather in southern Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, hears the call of the Lord to move to Haran in the Middle Euphrates region. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, God said, and I will make of you a great nation. And ends time for Abram, followed by a new time and a new name, Abraham. <coughs> Joseph, along with his brothers and father, Jacob, had a time in Canaan, then an end time as a slave in Egypt, and then a new time as a ruler for Pharaoh. Joseph's family, their time in Canaan, in Canaan came to an end time, which led to a new time in the land of Goshen in the Nile River Delta in Egypt. And their descendants, they had a time of freedom, then an end time in slavery, and then a new time of deliverance from Egypt. See some patterns here? It happens over and over in the Bible. Israel and Judah were united for a time, and it came to an end time, and then a new time for each of them, and an end for each of them in kidnapping and captivity, followed by a new time for each of them of return and rebuilding. How could the Apostle Paul, who knew his scriptures and knew his people's history behind him, not be preparing for another end time and a new time ahead in Christ? And outside the Bible, human history itself is one time followed by an end time and then a new time. And there's usually push and pull for these kinds of paradigm shifts. And that's why I thought of Thomas Kuhn, scientist and historian of science, in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, from 1962. And I was joking with my wife. This is where this kind of becomes a TED Talk, but I think it's very interesting, <laughs> and it applies to the scripture. I think Kuhn's ideas transcend science, and I think they apply to all human endeavors, even matters of faith and religious life. 
in something like what I'm calling the structure of spiritual revolutions. And right here, though, I mean the human spirit. Well, here's Kim's idea in a nutshell from something called supersummary.com online. <laughs> I just stumbled across that. I would hate to be a college professor today. How do you know what kids are turning in as theirs? Supersummary.com says about Thomas Kuhn, scientific revolutions in his framework represent a radical departure from existing paradigms. They occur when the accumulation of anomalies, and that's things that are unexpected and don't fit, reaches a critical point, challenging the power of the prevailing paradigm. It creates a crisis, or what I'm calling an end time. And it goes on. In response to this crisis, a new paradigm emerges, fundamentally altering the scientific landscape. It changes everything. Scientific revolutions are not mere extensions of existing knowledge, but involve a paradigm shift, wherein the new paradigm renders the old one obsolete. Paradigm shifts may be met with resistance from scientists because they call into question their prior work that was done under the old paradigm. They may be reluctant to detach from an old paradigm for a new one. Scientific revolutions then represent a shift in worldview. Now hear that again as what I'm calling the structure of spiritual revolutions. Again, though now, for now, the human spirit. Spiritual revolutions represent a radical departure from existing paradigms. They occur when the accumulation of anomalies reaches a critical point challenging the explanatory power of the prevailing spiritual paradigm, creating a crisis or an end time. In response to this crisis, a new one emerges, a new paradigm, fundamentally altering the spiritual landscape. Spiritual revolutions are not mere extensions of existing knowledge, but involve a paradigm shift wherein the new paradigm renders the old one obsolete. They may be met with resistance from leaders of the status quo. That is the way things are now or used to be not long ago because they call into question prior work that was done under the old paradigm. They may be reluctant to detach from an old paradigm for a new one. Revolutions of the human spirit then represent a shift in worldview. There you have the structure of spiritual revolutions, the human spirit, from time to end time to new time. Alexander the Great was great for a time. Then he died at his end time, leaving a new time, a Greek time, which evolved through the Roman Empire's time until its end time, leaving a new time for Western civilization. The Holy Roman Empire was great for a time for a thousand years until its end time in 1806, and you can pinpoint it when Emperor Francis II abdicated during the era of Napoleon, who had his time and his end time in the Battle of Waterloo, which led to a new time of peace in Europe. The agricultural revolutions had their time, then their end time, and a new time in the Industrial Revolution. In our own history, the colonies had a time, an end time in the American Revolution, and a new time as the United States. The Confederacy had a short time with a long, god-awful repercussion and an end time that led to another short time, a new time, and a new birth of freedom. Over and over and over, people live in time expectantly in either hope or fear of an end time and a new time. From horse-full carriages to horseless carriages, from telegraph to telephone to radio to TV to the internet, at each turn of time, some people were hopeful and some were fearful. And here we go again with AI, artificial intelligence. <clears throat> and you know, the human spirit being what it is and the Holy Spirit being a living spirit, the spirits get all mixed up sometimes. Paradigm shifts may be met with resistance from theologians and religious and spiritual leaders because they call into question prior work that was done under the old paradigm. Spiritual leaders may be reluctant to detach from an old paradigm for a new one. Spiritual revolutions then represent a shift in worldview. 
The structure of spiritual revolutions, as I'm imagining it, can be seen as the very framework of the ongoing, ever-changing human condition as it encounters the Holy Spirit. Or as we sometimes say in this church, of the church, Ecclesia Reformata Semper Reformanda. The church reformed, always reforming, according to the word of God and the call of the Spirit. The Spirit of God moves some professors in Germany to reform the church. A paradigm starts to shift at a church door in Wittenberg, Germany, and the church resists, and one era ends and another begins on battlefields. The Spirit of God moves some white people to treat slaves as human beings. Other white people resist, and the paradigm shifts, though, on the battlefield. The Spirit of God moves women and men to open the doors of ministry to women. Others resist. The church splinters into a mess of petty, personal paradigms. The Spirit of God moves, and against all expectations, LGBTQIA people, despite hostility from the church, come to Christ. <laughs> Too many in the church resist, as they have and probably will for a long, long time but I believe that time will end in a new time. It may be the end time, a new time that the Apostle Paul expected, preached on and hoped for, but let's hope and pray not that it doesn't take that long. Because I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown very short, for the form of this world is passing away. The form of this world is always passing away. Amen.